Welcome to the midweek edition of Business Morning Live on Channels Television. I'm Ladi Williams. Great to have you join us. Uh, let's take a look at what's in the news now. Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries uh, says it expects a strong demand for crude oil this year amid uh, monetary policy tightening. The oil cartel made this known in its monthly oil market report for January 2022. Now let's uh, see our crude prices climb to their highest level uh, yesterday since October 2014, despite rising uh, Omicron cases and supply concerns. You see Brent crude futures uh, today uh, rose about uh, $1.44 to $88.95 a barrel, uh, adding uh, to a 1.2% jump in the previous session. Uh, U.S. West Texas intermediate crude futures climbed a dollar fifty-one cents, adding a 1.9% gain uh, on Tuesday. Meanwhile, uh, forecasts for global oil demand and supply for 2022 uh, was kept largely unchanged from uh, last month's report. And back here, it appears the days of pyramids are returning with the launch of the Federal Capital Territory uh, Mega Rice uh, Pyramids uh, by the President in Abuja yesterday. Uh, the one million rice uh, paddy rice uh, stacked in 15 separate pyramids were planted and harvested from states across the country under the Central, Bank's, uh, Central Bank of Nigeria's Anchor Boros Program and the Rice Farmers Association of Nigeria, Rafan. In his address, President Mohamed Buhari said that the sky-high pyramids are part of his administration's commitment to achieving food security in the country. Our State House correspondent, Gloria Mazike, reports. The National Anthem, please. President Mohamed Buhari joins state governors, captains of industry, traditional leaders, security chiefs, as well as the Rice Farmers Association at the Abuja International Trade Fair for the historic unveiling of the FCT Mega Rice Pyramids. They need for me, this Your Excellency. Under the Central Bank of Nigeria Anchor Boros Program, the Rice Farmers Association facilitated the construction of one million bags of rice paddy, which are stacked to form these 15 pyramids. This, according to the president, will engender economic diversification and reduce rice imports. Our gathering here today is no doubt a testament to the fact that the Anchor Boros Program is working. I am aware that the bags of payday will be moving straight from here to rice milling plants across Nigeria, which will lead to the release of processed rice to the markets by the rice millers. The measure will aid our efforts at reducing the price of rice in Nigeria. The governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, Mr. Godwin Emefiele, and the Rice Farmers Association of Nigeria affirm that the Angkor Boras program has undoubtedly built a sustainable framework for financing smallholder farmers in the country. We're delighted that these efforts are, have yielded fruit in not just increasing the availability of rice, but also in moderating prices, reducing imports, and increasing job creation in our country. For example, Thailand alone exported 1.3 million tons of rice to Nigeria in 2014. The Anchor Boras program was launched by Your Excellency in Kebi in 2015 to curtail these imports, and since then, we have seen incremental reduction in rice imports from Thailand. As at the end of 2021, they only exported 2,160 metric tons of rice to Nigeria, thereby saving Nigeria foreign exchange and helping to preserve jobs for our people. Despite all the insecurity, the banditry, the flood, the kidnap, the drought, they became committed, and that is why you can see all these pyramids here. The unveiling of the mega rise pyramids is expected to further spur production in other states. I want to assure you, Mr. President, that the job is not done. We shall not relent until 
the availability of rice as a staple food is also at the most affordable rate for ordinary Nigerians. That's the next agenda in this campaign. The president also conducted an inspection of the already processed Nigerian rice. The CBN Anchor Boros program has so far enabled a 95% reduction of Nigeria's annual rice import bill from $1.5 billion in 2015 to 18. $5 million. Mr. President, along with his delegation. Now, aside improving on the national output of rice production beyond 9 million metric tons, the CBN Anchor Boras program is looking to do more, unveiling the first an inaugural rice pyramid in the south, south, and southeast, and also looking to unveil the maize pyramid by the Maize Association of Nigeria later in the year from the International Trade Fair Center here in Abuja. Gloria Umezuke, Channels Television News. All right, that was the unveiling of rice uh, pyramids uh, right there in Abuja. Anyway, let's uh, get to our first conversation now. We see digital credit, a fast-growing phenomenon in uh, many emerging uh, markets. We've seen uh, digital credit, which refers to uh, credit products, including digital payments, uh, products such as mobile money that are delivered fully via digital channels such as mobile phones and uh, via the Internet. Uh, these are usually referred to as unsecured cash loans, and they do come with risk, as lenders often have little or no credit history to use to make sound lending uh, decisions. For more now, we have uh, Damilola Alwede, Managing Director at uh, Periculum Nigeria, to tell us more about what Periculum is doing to solve these issues. Great to have you in the program. Yeah, thank you very much, Larry. Good, Good morning. morning. Good morning. So, uh, digital lending, you know, quite a, a risky venture, you know, for uh, lenders. Uh, tell us about, um, you know, what Periculum does to make this uh, actually easier for them, you know, noting that most of these loans are quite uh, unsecure. Okay, yeah. So, um, Periculum, we're a B2B fintech, and today we provide a digital credit assessment infrastructure. Um, the idea is basically to help um, lenders to make lenders and financial institutions to make uh, more informed and better credit decisions, and also to improve um, their risk management outcome, leveraging data analytics. And like you said, you know, um, the digital lending is now you know the, is, is the order of the day. And the idea basically is to ensure that you know the lenders are trying to play in this space, and we help them to make more informed de um, credit decisions. And um, so you might be thinking that you know why you know how how exactly is there is there an opportunity in this space? How do you want to solve this? And you know um, is it going to get better from here on? The answer is yes. You know it's going to get better from here on. And if we take a step back, in Africa today, you know according to IFC, um, there's a 300 billion dollar credit gap in Africa. So that's huge. So, so there's, you know, there's something that people are not doing right. So, you know, some people are, or actually, there's, there are some things that are, not, that are not even being done at all. Let's bring it down to Nigeria. There's a hundred billion dollar credit gap. So there's an opportunity there, and that's why we at Periculum are coming to say, um, let's help these um, digital lenders ensure that they make smarter credit decisions, so they can reduce the credit gap we have in Nigeria and also in Africa at large. All right, uh, uh, quite interesting, uh, but uh, I noticed there's also a risk for borrowers. You know, it, with, uh, I, I've seen a report of uh, actually a, a borrower, you know, getting a loan from one of these apps, and uh, he, he kind of uh, defaulted for maybe a couple of days and <laughs> had an issue where they, they sent out his obituary. Yeah, yeah, Quite interesting yeah. there. So how are the borrowers actually, you know, protected? Okay, so um, the idea is, uh, I, I think that that is very wrong. That's unethical. Yeah. Um, if as a borrower I come to you and I give you my information, the idea is meant to be safe with you. But at the same time, because these lenders are not, you know, many of them are not doing the right, they're not following the right credit assessment procedures. So you just want to give out cash. I'm not assessing Dami, for instance, to know does Dami have the capacity to pay back? Does he have the willingness to pay back? So many of them are scared. You know, you, you check their loan books and you're having default rate as high as 60%. Right. So they're beginning to, you know, they're, they're acting in a very, very absurd manner because, you know, they didn't see this coming. I gave out one million, for example, this week, and, you know, maybe I gave out one million to like 10 people, that's 10 million. And only seven people paid, or seven people did not pay back. I got a payment from only three people. 
I'm scared. What do I do next? You know, and, but the good thing that other, other um, um, institutions, institutions out there that, you know, that help you with ethical debt, debt recovery. So I think it's very, very unethical for people to, you know, for lenders to go after um, borrowers and, you know, put out their, de their details out there to say, oh, pay me back or, you know, I'll call all your contacts. Yeah, I've seen that contacts, also. I'll call yeah. your contact. <laughs> and they write very, 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 you know, crazy it, messages, you know. It's quite interesting. <laughs> so yeah. I, I think it's wrong. But, you know, when you leverage solutions that we provide, you are very, very assured that, you know, you are going to have low default rates because you'll be giving out loans to the right set of people. All right. So uh, another issue, you know, bad loans, you know, and uh, non-performing loans, we've seen that happen with, you know, traditional banks, you know. But uh, wouldn't it be the same issue, you know, with uh, digital lending? It's, it's practically the same thing, I, I want to believe. Okay, yeah, yeah. So the, the, um, the truth of the matter is, and this is reality, many financial, in, many financial institutions today leverage traditional data in their credit profiling. But in a world of total connectivity, today you have open, AP, you know, open banking APIs. You know, leveraging just one source of data provides more or brings more limitations than opportunities. And what we've been able to do, we've been able to unify alternative predictive data into one source and give comprehensive insights. So if now um, I wanted to you know, go to a particular place, or let's, let's use Lagos, for example, practical examples. So at least you know, we understand what we're trying to say. Exactly. You know, I'm trying to get to a particular destination from here. And the only way I've always known is to take these routes. And there's always traffic here. And now someone has come and said, you know, and the person says now, there are alternative routes you can take. And you know, there's no traffic. Instead of going straight and you know, hitting traffic, you can go this way, go this way, go this way, go this way. And you get there faster. That's the same thing we're trying to do. And that's exactly what we're doing. Instead of leveraging on just one single source of data, which everybody, most of them use traditional data today, you know, to limit you. We've said, we've unified all predictive alternative data, we give comprehensive insights, and we help you and advise you in making the right credit decisions. So tell me why you have bad loans. Tell me why your default rate will still be high. And tell me why you have high, uh, high non-performing loans. So that's the kind of problem that we solve today in the industry. All right. You know, talking about data now, you know, data has become the new gold. And, you know, when you try to uh, get loans from some of these apps, they, you know, get access to your uh, contact list. You know, it, it's, uh, it's quite scary, I, I, I must say, because they have, you know, access to sensitive information, you know, on your phone. But how can this data be actually protected? So in the first instance, I tell borrowers, when, you know, just generally when we meet and discuss situations like this or scenarios like this, any lender that is telling me you need information to my contacts, I'm not going to get loans from you. It means you don't know what you're doing. It's, it's plain and simple. If I have or have, you know, I'm leveraging on a smart credit assessment solution, I won't, I, what do I need your contact for? The only reason I asking for your contact is because if you default, I can, you know, send very crazy message to all your contacts and say, Dami has not paid back 10,000, call his father and call his mother, <laughs> or I will do this. You know, we've seen those kind of messages. Yeah. So why, why do I need that? You know, I've already said there are alternative predictive data out there, typically your historical transaction, your former performance transaction you've done in the past. There are a couple of data points that, you know, that will make sense of today that can tell you, does Ladi have the capacity to pay back? Mm. Does Ladi have the willingness to pay back? If the answer is yes to them, I'll give you loans. I, will not be having, I don't need to have access to your contact. The access to your contact does not tell me you're credit worthy. Mm. Access to your contact does not tell me if you have the capacity to pay back. So why am I asking for access to your contact? I need more predictive data sets, and that's where machine learning comes in. If you leverage machine learning, use the machine learning techniques, it helps you to easily identify a potential good loan from a potential bad loan during the underwriting process. So I don't need access to your contact. And I don't have to be worrying if my data is safe or not, or my contact is um, safe or not. Let's get more predictive data sets, make sense of it, leverage technology, and make the right credit decisions. All right, it's quite you know, tedious, I'm sure, getting all of this data you know, and uh, making sense of it. So how do you, at the curriculum, get this uh, data? How do you get your hands on this data and put it all together? Oh, fantastic. A lot of research has to be done. And that's why I keep using the word predictive data sets. Not all, data, uh, not all data available are predictive. So we have to understand the data that's going to make sense to us. And today, there are a lot of organizations out there, uh, third party providers that provide this data. And what we've done is, and I mentioned earlier, that a lot of these financial institutions, if you understand consumers' behavior, 
and you leverage technology, you know the data that are predictive. So to answer your question, how we get hands on data, we've partnered with a lot of organizations that provide data, data providers, and we aggregate those data. So we understand data that are predictive via machine learning. We understand data that are not predictive, so we don't need them to build anything. So when we're able to identify predictive data sets, we partner with the organization that provides these data, unify them, and we give comprehensive insights. So Quite interesting. So what sort of organizations can actually use your service? OK. Um, so there are a lot of organizations that can use our service, um, starting from commercial banks, because they give out loans. Um, so we help them to build credit models, um, machine learning credit models, like I said, to intelligently um, identify a potential bad loan from a good loan during the underwriting process. Also, we have microfinance banks, we have digital lenders like you spoke about, and a lot of you know, new um, industries that are beginning to come up. I'm sure you must have seen all these e-commerce guys that are now doing buy now, pay later. Because right. you know, we should live in a credit world. Credit will make your life easy. You know, if you want to buy that, your dream bends now. Why do I have to save 30 million to buy that car? You know, when I can just approach somebody and the guy tells me, take this car, brand new car. I'm talking about brand new here, honestly, not, you know, Let's not be talking of used cars. <laughs> you get me? You know, take this brand new car and pay over, maybe, you know. If you, if you live in a credit world, you know, my child wants to go to school. I should not be cracking my head. I'm saving for school fees. I should be able to approach somebody and say, you know, this is my data. You know, have access to my data. Make sense of it. And, you know, give us this loan. So let's, you know, and because they don't have this infrastructure is not in place, a lot of these financial institutions don't have access to this infrastructure. They don't leverage it, so they're not giving out these loans. So that's exactly what we do. So we talk about commercial banks, MFBs, um, guys into buy now, pay later. Now we have travel now, pay later. I want to book a flight now from here to Abuja. I'm looking for, head is like, so I'm probably 100K plus. I don't have, I should be able to go to a site, you know, one of these guys, one of these airlines apply. When I come back, I pay you. I'm credit worthy, you know, I just don't have, you know, I'm not just liquid now, doesn't mean I can't pay you. Right. So those, you know, those organizations are beginning to come up and we're helping them to, you know, assess, you know, um, the right people to give loans to. There's, a, there's also a new industry, a new organization, a new sect we've identified that we're working with the embassies because we, we analyze data. And, you know, in our world today, if you want to get, fortunately for us, if you want to travel, you have to get a visa to most countries, right. at least those European countries. Right. And embassies will tell you, bring your bank statements, you know, standard. <laughs> and what you see, I'm sure you're also aware, is that a lot of guys, when they want to, you know, apply for a loan, right. they get funds from somewhere that God knows where, and they, you know, put in their account, and the embassy sometimes fall for it and things like that. Mm. But it takes a long time. The guy has to manually sit down, go through your bank statement one by one. That's what they do today. And say, okay, uh, this guy has, he has a salary, blah, 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 and things like that. You know, with technology, real time, we can analyze that bank statement for you real time. What would typically take maybe that guy maybe one hour or so because he's not a professional? We do it real time. So we've saved you two hours of your time. At the same time, it picks out some sensitive things that they're not able to pick out. You know, fund recycling, influence your account that was actually not your own because our technology would have told the guy that this guy's average balance is 400K. He wants to apply for visa now, he's showing 4 million. Where did that come from? <laughs> <laughs> Those are the kind of, you know, comprehensive insight that, you know, manually you will not pick up. And if you want to even pick up manually, maybe you have to open an Excel sheet, start sweating, you know, using formulas and, you know, using two hours. And, you know, you have a technology that is telling you in real time, I can tell you that Dami inflated his, his bank statement. Don't give him a visa. Those visa no. applicants will not uh, be a fan of, of yours. Yeah, uh, they won't be a fan, but that, the same that's time. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, what's your outlook for, you know, this uh, digital credit space, you know, 2022? What, what are you seeing? Yeah, I think it's going to get more interesting from here because um, um, last year and, you know, before now, um, a lot of lenders, like you said, they were not going about lending the right way. They were not leveraging the right technology. Um, but, you know, we've come and we're here to tell you that, okay, don't be scared, relax. This, this is exactly what we do. Let's provide the technology to help you to identify the right set of people to borrow to. And let's not, when we're talking of there's a credit gap in Africa, let's not, let's not make a mistake. Don't think that there's no money to give out, one. I don't think that there are no borrowers that are waiting to collect that money. So that is not the problem. Practical example, Ladi, if you stand at the entrance of this office and you wave 100,000 and say, oh, I have 100,000 to give who wants, who is interested, and you pay me 10%, you know, just, just an example, 10% right. by this time next week. Trust me, before the end of, before two seconds, someone will grab the money and say, I will pay you back. But your own fear will be that this person that just collected my money, mm. can this person pay me back? Does he or she have the capacity to pay me back and the willingness to pay me back? It's not as if we don't have borrowers out there waiting to close that gap. It's not as if we don't have lenders that are liquid to give out the cash. 
commercial banks, you've seen their books, you know, it's public, they are very liquid. You see them right. declaring profit of 200 billion, you know, you've seen it now. But they don't want to lend, or they shy away from retail lending, because they, they struggle to know the people to lend to. Because today, imagine if you tell someone that, I can assure you that if you give out this money, you are going to get it back, 99% sure you get it back. I'll give out the money. Hmm. And that will close the credit gap. So the issue of the credit gap of 300 billion, 100 billion, as the case may be, is not because we don't have guys. I know, I know a couple of lenders last year, they didn't exhaust their lending budgets. You All know, right. Like, so that's the idea. That's exactly the problem we're coming to solve. So okay. 2022 is going to be a great year because there are a lot of opportunities. We're helping people to, you know, to help them to solve the problem of credit assessment. Right. And at the same time, we're also opening other um, industries, like I talked about, buy now, pay later, travel now, pay later, pay later and big, also the it's embassies. It's a big industry. So it's a big industry. It's, 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 look, it's looking, looking good for 2022. You have your your work cut out for you. Thank yes. you so much uh, for coming on the program. Thank you very Dabon much. Uh, Managing Director of Periculum Nigeria. Great to have you. Thank you very much. All right, uh, we'll take a break now. When we come back, uh, AFX Commodities Market Update is next. Do stay with us. This is Business Morning. <laughs> Right now, time for Apex Commodities update. Uh, for the weekend at 17th January 2022, Apex Commodities Exchange recorded a 17% increase in the volume traded, going from about 7.5 million to 8.7 million uh, in the week. Uh, let's hear more now from Femi Kende, analyst structuring and origination of uh, at Apex, uh, with the details. Uh, great to have you. Uh, great to be here, Ladi. All right, tell us uh, what was the activity like in the market. So the, um, the exchange actually experienced a significant surge in the level of activities compared to the previously reported week. Uh, for the week traded, uh, for the week we actually saw an increase in the turnover by about 60, 65% week on week, as over 2.8 million contracts, billion contracts were traded um, traded this week. For the volume traded, we actually saw an increase by 17% as 8.7 million contracts were traded this week. And for the number of deals, we actually saw an increase by 12% week on week as 664 deals were executed this week. Um, for the financial benchmarks on the exchange, we actually saw a significant surge in the level of activities or in the, um, in the returns posted by this um, benchmark, especially for the FS Commodity Index, as the index reported 5.5. One three percentage week on week to close the week at 506 basis points. Uh, for the export FX export index, we actually saw a marginal increase of about 0.68 percentage increase week on week. Uh, for the value traded across all commodities um, on the exchange, um, May's account May's continue to account for a significant bulk, um, bulk of the trade. However, the trade in soybean, paddy rice, and sorghum peaked for the reporting week, uh, and we also experienced trades in the exports um, uh, for export commodities like cocoa. For the week, uh, May actually closed the week at a, with a two point, with a two point one two percentage increase week on week. Um, report uh, to close at two hundred and thirty nine uh, thirty nine naira per contract. Soybean actually closed the week at three hundred and ninety nine naira per contract, which represented a zero point three six percentage increase week on week. Um, Paddy rice closed the week at two hundred and twenty two twenty four naira per contract, which represented a zero point one nine percentage increase week on week. Sogom actually closed the week at two hundred and thirty nine naira per contract, which represented an eleven point five nine percentage increase week on week. And cashew in Cashew closed the week with a marginal increase of 0.84% week on week. However, for cocoa, we actually saw a significant decline in the um, pricing of the commodity on the exchange as the commodity closed the week at 1,200 naira per contract, which represented a 7.47 percentage increase week on week. Um, for more information about our report, you could actually check our website, which is www.afxnigeria.com, or you could actually follow us on our social media handles at afxnigeria.com or Comex by Afx. All right, Femi, thanks for that update. But uh, the recent uh, CPI report by the NBS indicated an uptick in general price levels. Uh, how does this relate to performance in the commodities market? Right, interesting question, Ladi. So, as we all know, inflation is actually a lagging indicator um, showing uh, the effect of economic activities on general price level in the domestic economy. And what is worthy to note is the, the sharp increase in food inflation as reported by the MBS, which, um, of which um, food inflation actually closed the year with a 7.37 increase week um, year on year. Um, 
at AFEX, we've actually observed a, an interesting um, correlation between maize prices and food inflation in the country. Um, and this, this actually shows, um, or what we've been able to observe is that maize prices actually um, maize prices actually move in a direction to which the food inflation prices end, end, end up moving um, in, in, in the next quarter or so. Uh, with this in mind, we know we've, you can actually identify that maize is actually key to, every, um, to the typical household in Nigeria. And the continuous upsurge in maize prices will continue to lead to a, an increase in, um, in general price level, especially for food, um, food uh, commodities in the country. With this in mind, we, it's, it's, it shows the, the the looming threat of food uh, insecurity in the country because, I mean, the, the, the use of maize in the country is actually um, a spread between industrial use to um, household use. So if, this, if the prices of this commodity continues to increase, we know that um, households will actually continue to uh, accredit more of their um, income to um, food consumption up to the point to which they can afford it. And with this in mind, we, we, we think a, a lot of things need to be done in order to regulate prices in the country, food right, um, commodities uh, prices in the country. Okay, now, you know, we're talking about the uh, commodity uh, super cycle there, but how well did, uh, you know, comparable staples perform in the international market, you know, compared to uh, the domestic market? So, uh, as posted by the World Bank, um, um, grains, in, um, grains in the international market actually experienced the, a good year as um, in maize actually exceeded about 300,000, 300, 000, 300 um, per metric ton mid um, May. Um, this has last, the last time this occurred was around um, 2013, uh, 2013. So if, if you, and the reason, the reason for this continuous upsurge in commodities prices, even in the international market, was as, uh, can be accredited to um, supply shortage, shortage including um, the increased cost, um, which can be di um, broken down into the increased cost of uh, inputs, and also the increased demand by um, China for feeds. Um, However, according to World Bank, they're actually expecting a, a moderation in the level of commodities prices in the coming year. And this is, um, this is um, in accordance to um, USDA's um, um, forecast for um, um, grain production for the year. However, there's a threat to this, uh, to this um, forecast, as we know that the use-to-stock ratio, which measures supply to relative expected demand, actually is expected to decline by about 1%. So with this in mind, we, we think prices will continue to move in a, in, a, in a upward trajectory, regardless of the increase in production. All right. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Femi Kennedy, Analyst Structuring and Origination at uh, Apex. Thank you so much. All right. So, uh, still with Apex now. Uh, Apex would release its uh, annual commodities outlook report uh, next week. And the Apex annual commodities outlook shows uh, perspectives on how the 2021 commodities market performed and how the commodities uh, market might perform come uh, right in 2022. Uh, let's uh, bring in David Ibilakwa now, Senior Research Analyst at Apex, to tell us uh, what to expect. Great to have you on the program. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. Happy New Year, Nadi. Happy New Year. Nice to be here. So, yeah, so uh, how was the year 2021 like for the commodities market? What were the major highlights in the year for you? Um, thank you, Ladi, for that question. Um, 2021 was actually a good year for investors, basically. Um, and we're coming from 2020, given the fact that um, we saw a lot of um, supply chain disruption um, induced by the COVID pandemic. Um, 2021, we saw consistent increase in prices, or rally, I would say, um, in, across commodities, right? Um, and these commodities actually rose to their all-time highs um, um, during the first um, three quarters of the year. And also, um, we saw um, a correlation, a very strong correlation between um, FX movements um, during the year and also commodities prices. Um, as prices actually um, rose about 30% um, compared to, to, to um, 2020. Right. Um, also, we also saw that um, some global factors also um, affected the prices of commodities um, in, in 2021. For example, um, fertilizer prices. Um, there was a rally in global fertilizer prices during the year. Um, according to the World Bank um, pink sheet um, data, um, we saw that the fertilizer index actually rose by 163% um, compared to 2020. And this was driven by over 200 percent increase in, in the cost of, in the price of urea, right? Um, and we understand that there's always a translatory effect on um, domestic prices, given the fact that we're actually um, 
import um, fertilize, uh, fertilizers um, to to um, help in our production processes, right? Um, and also, and if you look at in the global space, energy um, prices um, also increased, and we saw that translated effect on fertilizer prices. Um, in Europe, for example, um, there was um, a surge in, in natural gas price, um, which, 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 which was as a result of um, a widespread cut back on um, the production of ammonia, which is actually an, a very important input um, in the production of nitrogen fertilizer, right? Um, also, we saw a similar um, trend also in the U.S. Um, caused by the uh, hurricane Ida, which also um, saw that um, big uh, fertilizer producers had to clamp down on production. Um, then also, we saw in China um, a, a, a surge, a rally um, in, in coal prices, which um, saw China actually ration, uh, ration electricity usage across provinces and also caused fertilizer pro um, producers to also clamp down on um, production, right? And all of these actually had a, uh, had a translatory effect on um, commodities prices um, in, in our domestic space. Yeah, and uh, most traders were able to take advantage of that. It's a pity I couldn't. Well, but, yeah. uh, you know, quite an interesting year, but what <laughs> factors, you know, could typically shape the, you know, commodity market this year? You know, what are you, what's your uh, outlook for prices? Maybe another super cycle. Uh, so, um, I would say, um, like um, when I have conversations with people, I would say that um, the, the biggest threat um, to, to, to global economies, and um, also Nigeria inclusive, um, is actually inflationary pressure. Yeah, we understand that the COVID-19 pandemic and also the Omicron virus um, um, variant could actually also pose some level of threat. Um, but I would say the biggest, um, uh, the biggest threat uh, will be um, inflationary pressure. And why do I say this? Um, so in the domestic space, we are, our outlook for commodities is that for me, for example, it's going to cross the um, 300,000 per metric ton um, benchmark. Uh, for Sogom, cross the 400,000 um, um, naira per, per metric ton benchmark. Um, and so we are seeing continued um, pressure on prices. And this is, this is actually due to the fact that when you look at our production um, estimates for last year, which is 2021 in this case, um, we are we are a little um, bullish on, on production um, outcomes um, across major um, commodities, right? And these production levels are not significant enough to mop up uh, the, 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 the demand in the, in the open market, right? So we are seeing a lot of um, um, heightened demand in the open market, and also we are seeing that um, traders um, in the open market are anticipating this price hike and are also um, engaging in ordinary activities, right? So these factors are going to actually push um, prices um, further northwards um, this year. Then also, um, I spoke about fertilizer prices. Um, um, the, the outlook for fertilizer prices is actually bleak. We expect um, further pressure on fertilizer prices, which will also have a um, translatory effect um, on domestic prices of commodities, right? And, and also, when we look at um, the FX market, right, um, like I said, like my colleague also established, we're able to um, establish a strong correlation between um, FX movement and um, commodities prices um, of, of, of major commodities like, like um, maize, soybean, sorghum. And also, if you look at the fact that um, the commodity is relatively, re relatively cheaper um, in the domestic market, so Traders, um, um, have, uh, we've seen a lot of cross-border trades, um, um, which has also supported um, a lot of demand, um, external demand, competing with internal um, domestic demand for these same okay. commodities at um, the given level of supply, which we think actually are major factors that would pressure prices not worse right. this year. All right. So, you know, in line with, you know, possible continuous upward trend in uh, prices this year, how does, you know, the commodities market provide solutions to the investing public? Yeah, um, that's a very interesting question. Thanks, Ladi. Um, so I would say, right, first and foremost, one of the major objectives um, for investors um, when you see when they want to invest is that um, they must be able to at least gain um, um, positive real return, right? Um, that's return that will beat inflation, right? And over the last three years, we've seen that the commodity space, um, investing in commodity space has been able to return back to investors, um, returns that beat inflation um, as against um, some other traditional asset classes, um, like the stocks um, and, and others, uh, which typically 
normally are, are characterized by negative um, um, real return as well as um, inflation rates at basis, um, the return that, that, that it gets um, for that year, right? So I think um, the commodities markets can provide an edge against inflation, um, inflationary pressure for, for investors. Then also, I think um, it also provides, provides an edge um, against um, FX um, currency devaluation or let's say the weakening of, of the Naira against the US dollars, right? So like we said, right, so we've seen um, a, a strong correlation between um, um, commodities prices and FX movement. And so for, for every 30% um, 30, 30 um, depreciation in, in Naira, we also seen like a 25% increase um, in the value of um, a maize or a sorghum, for example, right? right. Um, then also, uh, we, I, we believe also that it will also provide an edge against um, supply chain um, um, issues, right? So when you take a look at um, across the value chain, so one of the challenges that, that profess, um, um, processors would naturally face is um, the assurance that they would get the, um, the level of, of of, of supply um, this year or next year um, than they got um, the previous year, right? So on the exchange, for example, we provide products like um, um, the Ford contracts that can actually help, um, um, that could assure processors um, this level of um, supply at a given price to mitigate any form of price um, risk that may come up, right, um, during the course of the year. And so we think these are actually a lot of benefits for, for, okay. for investors. Quite, quite. And I, I must yeah. say that, Beyond even the return benefit, um, there's also the point where investors are also um, um, impacting the lives of households. So we understand that for every pressure in, in commodity prices, right, um, there is always um, um, the household actually feel the brunt of this of this pressure, right. So if we, if if, prices are, if we are able to stem prices down, also the households okay. also are beneficial they, they are right. beneficiaries of that of that. Um, and right. also look at farmers, um, yes. input finance notes like products that we that we um, pr um, provide on our exchange could also provide farmers the um, resources, the finances to actually procure right, um, imputes for their production. Levels. All right, David. Well, yeah, you know, you. with rising inflation, you know, globally, everyone needs a hedge uh, right now, David. Thank you so much, uh, David Vidakwa, sure. Senior Research Analyst at Apex. Thank you so much. Take a moment now. Yeah, yeah thank you, Ladi, for Thank you, Ladi, for having us. Thank you. All right. All right, now for an opening call to the market, we have uh, Aniete added right there. Well, Aniete, it looks like uh, it was all about the Boer family yesterday. Yes, uh, Ladi, good morning. morning. Yes, uh, it was about the Boer family, of course. That's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bear weather stock. And to be specific, Boer Foods, which has now crossed into the, the suits, what you call the suits, the stocks worth over one trillion naira at the exchange. That made some magic, uh, made a rebound, uh, you know, at the equities market. But I'll be talking equities later. Our first point of call would be the fixed income market first, um, where trading at the, uh, at, at the bond segment, was, it continued on the, uh, on the bullish trajectory. Number of deals carried out there was nine, and uh, most of the uh, attention was focused on the 2022 20, uh, January uh, uh, 2026 paper, the 22nd of, of January uh, paper. So we had more of a bullish sentiment there, and of course, investors' demand was mostly for the um, 2049 bonds, but closed flat at the long end. And then, of course, at the Treasury bills, of course, for, for the Treasury bills, there was not much of activity there. It was rather quiet. The uh, uh, average yield there was unchanged at 4%. But when we flip over to the open market operations, what you call the OMO there, attention was more focused on the 8th of February 2022 paper. 6.2% is the discount. And the number of deals carried out there, three. The total number of deals uh, uh, carried out at that segment was just seven. So they're being rather cautious, especially a, uh, a day after the National Bureau of Statistics released Nigeria's inflation for, uh, numbers for December, which shows a rebound uh, um, in, in contrast to what we had in the month of um, November. We, we, we had 15.63% as the inflation rate for uh, for the December uh, inflation numbers against 15.40% recorded in November. So 
of course, inflation remains a very, very big uh, mention across the world. The U.S. inflation is at um, 40 years high, and we just have some uh, breaking news that uh, uh, U.K.'s inflation has hit its highest level in 30 years. So we will be looking out for the, uh, the effects of inflation on uh, you know, fixed income market instruments as well as the financial markets. So we will also be having Choma Udu uh, to talk to us about that market space if we have her, so we'll get her to talk to us more about it. Now, still talking about the fixed income market, we move over to the CBN special bills. Number of deals carried out on the 20, 28th of February 2022 paper, two deals. The total number of de deals carried out there was three. Okay, so now let's talk to Choma Udu, who is a fixed income uh, uh, trader at GT Bank, to tell us more about that market. Thank you for joining us, Choma. Hello, Chama, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Okay. Okay, so uh, the inflation figures, I want to know, can you tell us how are inv uh, investors reacting to that rebound in inflation numbers? And then, of course, we will be having the MPC meeting next week. So what's your outlook for that? Well, the sentiment, okay, I mean, the CPM will be under pressure as for the benchmark rate due to this inflation. We've seen um, uh, inflation has been down uh, consecutively for eight times, eight times, eight times, eight times, and it rose by 0.3% um, and to 15.63. So it was largely, largely driven by sitting, sitting box, which grew from um, 17.21 to 17.37. Um, well, we know that the CGM will under pressure to reduce the NTA rate as we see the uptick of inflation. And then globally, we have seen other countries, central banks, signaling an upward movement in benchmark rate. So that could inform their decision at the next NTC. Now, back here, local investors, the, the fixed income market seems to, you know, is still within that lackluster performance, especially as the month of January is, you know, gradually grow, going into its still end. We're in the middle of the week of, uh, uh, of January. Now, do you see investors still putting their money into fixed income market instruments, or are they, uh, where, where are they putting their money into? Well, we expect an update um, in the fixed income market from um, towards the end of this month, this week, and then from next week um, as a result of the uh, maturities and the liquidity coming into the system. Today, we have a bond auction where 150 billion is an offer across two channels, um, the 2026 and the new 20-year uh, paper, which is the 2042. Um, we expect there's going to be demand because, like I earlier mentioned, we expect um, some liquidity to come into the system. And that will you know, create an, a, a big performance in the fixed income space. We expect that to trigger some performance you know, activity in the fixed income space. Okay, thank you for that analysis, uh, Choma. So that was uh, um, Choma Udu, fixed income dealer at GT Bank. So let's flip over to that market we were talking about, the equities market. It made a rebound, 138.05 billion is what the investors gained yesterday, which translates to about 0.58% increase on Tuesday, and then bringing the year-to-date gain at the market to, four, to around 4.5%. And then, of course, that came on the day that Boa Foods made its fact behind the listing about, about a month, almost a month ago uh, the, the, that, that uh, consumer goods bellwether listed by introduction. And, of course, it has joined the league of the, the one trillion uh, Naira group on the NGX. And when you take a look at sectoral performance, all positive, the lone, the lone ranger in the red zone was the insurance sector, which was down by 1.61%, largely due to the bellwether components in that, uh, in that space. So now yeah. for the equities market, it's still you know, doing rather, rather, rather still, impressive. Still holding up well, exactly. Uh, I must say, Anete. All right, thank you so much, Anete. All right, uh, we'll take a break now. When we come back, uh, we'll head to London. That's in a moment. Just stay with us. Welcome back. Let's take a look at what's happening in the UK. We see uh, data out shows uh, inflation hit a 30-year uh, 30 30-year high in the UK. Uh, let's uh, hear more now from uh, Juliana. Great to have you, Juliana. So the number. Good morning, Aladdin. 
Good morning. Well, this is the number is 5.4 percent higher since 1992, and analysts are predicting that inflation will peak at about 6.5 percent in April. Uh, I guess uh, it's uh, quite expected. Yeah, as you said, 5.4% uh, to jump from 5.1% in November is, is way above um, anybody's expectations. As you said, um, lots of economists predict that by April uh, the cost of living could rise uh, to about 6.5%. Some would even say uh, 7%. Later today, uh, the Bank of England Governor Andrew Bailey will be sitting in front of a cross-party group of MPs at the Treasury Select Committee, and no doubt inflation is going to be at the top of everybody's minds because, of course, we've also got really high energy costs. The government are having emergency meetings uh, practically every day now uh, with energy bosses trying to figure out how they're going to take away some of those costs when we expect bills to rise by 50% um, in April. I think with today's uh, data, it's really been led by the, the price of food. I think anybody living in the UK at the moment will see that when you go to the checkout, uh, food is, uh, is rising. I believe inflation on food is now at about 4.5%. This is the highest level in nine years. So things are uh, pretty serious now. No wonder uh, the FTSE fell as soon as this uh, data was released by the Office for National Statistics. And a uh, separate figure out yesterday showed that uh, pay rises have failed to keep up with uh, inflation. There seems to be a double whammy here. Yeah, it is a double whammy. I think economists had predicted before the end of 2021 that uh, the theme of this year, unfortunately, for those living in the UK, isn't Omicron or COVID. It is the squeeze. It's, it's, it's pretty tough right now, especially for the labour market and employers. Yes, there are record number of people um, in jobs. I believe um, it's gone down now, the unemployment figure, to about 4.1%, which is fantastic if you look at international uh, figures. But uh, pay hasn't risen. Uh, with the level of inflation or the cost of living. I believe it's at about 4.5%. We know inflation is now at 5.4%. Lots of employers are now having uh, to provide new recruits with bonuses, and that's if they can even get them uh, to start their jobs in the first place. So it's, it, it's difficult times. We'll have to wait and see um, how Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister, reacts um, during House uh, Prime Minister's questions, which takes place at 12 yeah. o'clock. Yeah, we'll be tracking that. Quite interesting uh, time, I must say. All right, Juliana, thank you so much. Uh, see you later at 1.30. Thank you. All right, now let's uh, take a look at what's uh, happening in the crypto space there. Let's uh, have the uh, market cap that was seated at uh, $2.11 trillion. It's uh, down about 2.11%, uh, 24 volume trade at $78.67 billion dollars. Uh, up about 4.07%. Uh, Bitcoin dominance there, 40.12%. Uh, it's uh, up 0 0.39. See, it's been hovering around that uh, range for a while now. Pr let's look at price of Bitcoin, uh, $41,687. We see Bitcoin traded towards uh, 41200 before recovering against the U.S. dollar. We see must uh, clear 42800 to start a fresh increase in the near term. We see Bitcoin the extended decline traded below the 42,000 uh, support zone. So it's a decision time for Bitcoin right there. We see volume $22.93 billion. Uh, let's look at Ethereum there. $3,098. Uh, Looks like it wants to get below that uh, $3,000 support. It's uh, down about 3.30% this morning. 24-hour uh, volume traded $13.34 billion traded in Ethereum. Let's look at the top alts by market cap now. Uh, BNB there uh, down about 2.99%. Uh, uh, anyway, let's uh, talk to Solomon Amunde now. Hello, Solomon. Great to have you. Hello, Solomon. Yeah, good morning, Larry. Good morning. Good, good morning. morning. Uh, great to have you. So we have this record-breaking deal here with a tech giant, uh, Microsoft, uh, buying Activision. Quite a, an incredible deal there, about $69 billion. Uh, but I see the crypto community is quite excited about this. Why? Yeah, yeah Microsoft is, is a massive company among the top 10 companies in the world. And Activision is actually the top three gaming companies in the world also. So Microsoft acquiring Activision for over $60 billion. That is actually great news because Microsoft is heavy on the metaverse 
and as a big company, they want to go in really big and they want to really, really change things. And they believe so much that gaming would help shift the metaverse a whole lot. And we all know that Microsoft Xbox has over 25 million subscribers. So you can imagine bringing 25 million persons to the metaverse. That is massive for the crypto community, basically. Quite interesting. And another giant, Mercedes, uh, Mercedes Benz uh, has partnered with you know, some NFT artists. Uh, should we expect to see maybe a Benz showroom in the metaverse? Yeah, that, that is 100% possible. We have so many brands now trying to buy land in sandbox metaverse, and some are also purchasing in decentralized finance is building their office in sandbox, and we have so many other companies doing the same thing. So I also suspect that the city is going to be looking at probably building a showroom in the metaverse. It's 100% possible. Well, that's quite interesting. Anyway, we see uh, Bitcoin is struggling. Uh, Solomon, this morning, uh, look at your crystal ball there. Tell me what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah basically, we're still, we're still on a strong uptrend. We have a very strong support at about 39,800, between 39,300 and 39,800. And we really need Bitcoin to hold 40,000 and 39,000. Or should we break that? That would be drastic for us. We might see the crypto market cap dropped from about $2 trillion to about $1.5 trillion, which would be a huge loss, basically. But we're still expecting Bitcoin to hold $40,000. So what I'm playing right now is I'm short. I'm short with a very tight stop loss. Should Bitcoin break above $40,000? All right. All right, Solomon, thank you so much. We keep watching. It's still extreme fear in that market uh, right now. Anyway, let's take a look at uh, top five uh, gainers. Uh, the gainers, so we see Tfuel there. Uh, leading that count is uh, at 18 cents, up about 7.01 percent, and we see uh, stacks uh, up about 6.76 percent. We see stacks uh, have a little, uh, they have some news about uh, helping uh, a Bitcoin, you know, scale at this point. And we see uh, Theta there, Theta and Tfuel in the top five games. Wonder what's going on with both of them. Uh, Four dollar 23 cents. It's uh, up about 5.02 percent, and Ethereum Classic. Wow, I've not seen that on the top five gainers list in a while. It's at 33 dollars 56 cents. Uh, that's the uh, fork from Ethereum, and we see a uh, Neo there. Neo 24 dollars 72 cents, down 1.9 percent. Let's look at the top losers. Uh, we see uh, Internet Computer back in the top losers counter, down 11 percent. Uh, Harmony having that pullback there. Got as high as about 32 cents. It's uh, trading at 29 cents this morning. Uh, Cardano, Cardano, I see a lot of profit taking with Cardano there. It's down 10.85% after having a brief uh, uh, rally. And uh, yeah, the top of my market cap is all red, all red there with uh, Cardano, the biggest uh, loser there. And XRP, 74 cents, down about 2.78%. So that's how it's looking in the crypto market this morning. It's still extreme fear. And now uh, that's a wrap on the program. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to join us by 1.30 on Business Incorporated for more updates and developments in the world of business. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Ladi Williams. Bye for now.